In the building behind me, over a hundred years ago, an aspiring animator from Kansas City embarked on a journey that would give rise to one of the most iconic characters of all time, a whistling mouse aboard a steamboat. And while the business behind me would fail, the animator did not give up and made the move to California, starting a new animation studio, proudly emblazoned with their own family name. However, this animator was not Walt Disney. This is the story of Ub Iwerks, the genius history almost forgot. I only hope that we never lose sight of one thing, that it was all started by a mouse. Mickey Mouse hopped out of my mind on a train ride from Manhattan to Hollywood. Ub Iwerks, meanwhile, remembered a different scenario. Walt loved to tell tall tales of the story about how Mickey came to be. He told it in different versions over the years himself. Um, and I wish he got, had gotten more credit through the years. But we didn't get credit. We weren't supposed to get credit. He didn't create itchy. I did. Huh? He stole a character from me in 1928. He animated Mickey. He's, he is the guy, really. And, and even Walt, I think, finally sort of started admitting that towards the end, uh, that without Ub, there wouldn't have been a Mickey. This is Ub Iwerks. And if you look him up in any capacity, this will be 90% of the photos you find of him. In fact, there are a shockingly small number of pictures of Ub for someone who worked in the business of moving pictures for over 50 years. But that in a microcosm is how best to describe Ub, behind the scenes, unsung, and certainly not in front of the camera. In many respects, he represents the flip side of the coin compared to the man whose connection with him would come to define his legacy, Walt Disney, the charismatic icon whose name and likeness has become synonymous with entertainment the world over. But who is Ub Iwerks? Why haven't you heard of him? And why is his name on every classic Mickey Mouse cartoon? Born Ub Iwerks to his parents Laura and Ert, Ub would later change his name legally to make it easier to pronounce. Ub and his mother were Ert's third family, and when Ub reached high school, Ert continued the pattern, leaving his family yet again. Ub would drop out to pursue full-time work to provide for his mother. Ub refused to talk about his father, even to his children and later grandchildren. And years later, when he got a call from Kansas City that his father had died, his simple response was to throw him in a ditch. In 1919, against his mother's wishes, Ub decided to start looking for work in the creative field, following his passion of art and drawing. Ub was able to secure a job at the Peshman Rubin Commercial Art Studio, designing layouts for local businesses, where he excelled at airbrushing and lettering. A month after Ub started at the company, one Walter Disney joined. Ub noticed that Walter would practice lettering his own name in different variations, such as Walter Disney, W.E. Disney, Walter Elias Disney, and even Walt Diz. When he asked Ub which he thought looked best, Ub said Walt Disney. The outgoing Walt and the shy Ub became fast friends, as Ub taught Walt everything he knew about drawing. After the two were laid off following a holiday rush, they decided to go into business together, forming the Iwerks Disney Commercial Artist. They worked out of the closet of a local restaurant and paid rent by doing art for the restaurant. Walt left to take a job at the Kansas City Slide Company, and without him to seek out clients, Iwerks Disney declared bankruptcy. Ub joined Walt at the Kansas City Slide Company, where the two were first exposed to animation. They spent hours at the Kansas City Public Library reading books on art of animation, and at the local theater watching every animation possible. Walt came up with the idea to make animated shorts about local happenings around Kansas City and sell them to the local movie theater chain called Newman's Theaters. They would be called Newman's Laughograms and would comment on local Kansas City problems like potholes and public transportation. Energized by this success, Walt quit his job at the Kansas City Slide Company to start Laughogram Films. He asked Ub to join him, but Ub, who was worried about having a steady paycheck and had already bankrupted one company already with Walt, declined initially. But after a month, Ub couldn't resist and joined the team. Along with Ub, Walt hired many local animators, some of whom would become very influential in the world of animation. This included Hugh Harmon, Rudy Ising, and Frizz Freely, along with the organist at the local theater, Carl Stalling. 
Initially, the company was very successful and was able to churn out some very innovative animation. However, when the largest buyer of their work went out of business and failed to pay them any of the money they owed them, the company fell on hard financial times. Walt was evicted from his house and moved in with Ub and his mother before eventually just living in laughograms. Rather than pay off any of the money they owed to their debtors, Walt decided to pour all the money they had made into one last project, Alice in Wonderland. The project was innovative in that it successfully integrated live action and animation. However, shortly after finishing the project, the financial burden became too great and Laughogram Studio had to declare bankruptcy. Walt spent all of his remaining money on a train ticket for Los Angeles to go stay with his brother Roy, taking with him the only successful print of Alice in Wonderland. Ub was able to get back his job at the Kansas City Slide Company and for the next year enjoyed steady employment. Over that time, Walt sent him numerous letters begging him to come out to LA to work at his new animation studio, Disney Brothers. And while the temptation was great, Ub was wary, having already bankrupted two companies with Walt. But after a year, the temptation was too much, and Ub once again followed Walt, driving him and his mom all the way to Los Angeles. Walt was able to pitch the Alice cartoon to Margaret Winkler, who commissioned the Disney Brothers Studios to create more. After Ub arrived in Los Angeles, Walt decided he wouldn't animate again and would become just a director. Margaret Winkler's husband, Charles Mintz, took over the business and was very critical of the stuff the Disney Brothers Studio was putting out. However, Ub and Walt were able to come up with a hit, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. The team was churning out Oswald cartoons left and right, making a strong profit and garnering much success. Worried that Ub would get burned out, Roy suggested to Walt that they give him a share in the company, and eventually Ub owned 20% of the Disney Brothers Studios. Around this time, Charles Mintz was still incredibly critical of the studio and really didn't think that there was anything special. He owned the rights to Oswald the Lucky Rabbit and thought that if he got all of the animators, he could make more money and cut Walt out of the deal. Charles Mintz sent his brother-in-law, George Winkler, to poach all of the animators from Disney Brothers Studios. They made an offer to Up, but Up declined and told the Disney Brothers, who brushed it off as nonsense. Walt went to New York to try and negotiate higher pay with Mintz, and Mintz told him that he had bought all of the animators out from under him. Uh, Not only am I not going to give you more money, uh, I've stolen most of your staff away, they're already signed to work for me, and I own the character. Now before I get into the controversy surrounding the actual creation of Mickey, I want to appreciate how the team of Walt, Roy, and Ub went from losing everything, their team and their only successful character, to having the biggest name in animation in about a year. While the entire Disney staff had announced their intention to leave, they still had to finish out the last two weeks with the company, so Ub and Walt had to work in secret to create the first Mickey cartoon. Working in a locked back room or Walt's garage, Ub animated the entire Mickey Mouse cartoon by himself in two weeks. And while technically impressive, Plain Crazy in the follow-up Gallop and Gaucho did little to draw audience attention to the fledgling mouse. With dwindling hope and funds, what remained of the Disney company sunk all they had into the third Mickey Mouse cartoon, Steamboat Willie. And while Walt was convinced this would wow over audience that they could sync the sound to the animation, Renting out the New York orchestra to record the sounds was expensive, and on the first attempt, it was a disaster. But, after blowing even more money to rehire the orchestra, and having Ub animate a bouncing ball to help the musicians get the timing right, the first Sing Sound cartoon was born, and debuted in New York theaters that year. Audiences went crazy, and Mickey Mouse was officially a star. Because of this success, they're able to hire more animators and begin cranking out new Mickey cartoons as fast as possible. In addition to Mickey, they start another series at the behest of their old Kansas City buddy, Carl Starling, called Silly Symphonies. Carl would first do the music, and then Ub would animate something to go along with it. The first of these was the iconic Skeleton Dance, where Ub was able to showcase his talents and explore a much darker theme than most of the other cartoons at this time. Let's rewind to the birth of Mickey Mouse. Walt Disney had just received the gut-wrenching news that he had lost Oswald, along with the majority of his staff, except for Ub. 
Over the years, Walt spun various renditions of Mickey's origin story, understanding the power of a narrative that's more catchy than myth than stark reality. In the book A Mouse Divided, the evolution of Walt's tale takes center stage showcasing the different versions he crafted. Perhaps the most iconic and frequently recounted version involves Walt brainstorming Mickey on the train ride back from New York, spurred by the loss of Oswald. He sketches then and there, giving life to a star. Another legend suggests Walt kept the mouse in his laughogram desk in Kansas City, training it to do tricks. Yet another narrative claims it was entirely family of mouse, or that Walt had been doodling mice on letters to his family for years. These diverse tales intentionally create the illusion that Mickey predates Oswald, making him the destined star from the beginning. Over and over again in the different inflections, it becomes myth. Now Ub's version takes a more down-to-earth approach. After Walt's return from New York, the two spent hours brainstorming, with the two envisioning characters and Ub sketching out ideas. Realizing that no one had explored a mouse character, Ub drew various concepts before settling on one they liked the most. This is substantiated by a surviving piece of paper showcasing the initial sketches of Mickey, all done by Ub Iwerks. Walt came back discouraged to Hollywood. We discussed the possibilities of a new character. We tried sketches of dogs and cats, but there were already too many cats. I went through batches of magazines. Live for Judge, we ran into cartoons of animals and got an idea for a mouse. There hadn't been any. Beyond the lack of credit, the growing divide between Walt and Ub wasn't just about recognition, but also Walt's insistent micromanaging as Mickey's success soared. With each triumph, Walt's demand on his staff escalated, and Ub, passionate about his craft, found it hard to tolerate such interference. One notable incident saw Walt altering the timing sheets for the skeleton dance after Ub had left for the night. Discovering the changes in the next morning, the usually reserved Ub exploded at Walt, asserting that he never touched his sheets. Ub wasn't just any other staff member. He had been by Walt's side for almost a decade, witnessing the highs and lows of multiple business ventures together. To be treated like just another animator felt insulting, especially considering Ub owned 20% of the company along with Walt and Roy. However, the lack of credit certainly didn't help. In a well-known incident, Walt was asked to draw Mickey for a kid at a party attended by both him and Ub. Walt insisted that Ub draw Mickey and then he would sign it. Like, sure kid, I'll draw you a picture Mickey Mouse. And he handed the paper to Ub Iwerks and Ub goes, whoa, are you kidding me? This is, what? No, I'm out of here. And while we can't pinpoint the exact breaking point, when Ub received an offer for higher pay and an opportunity to run his own studio, he seized it. He sold back his shares of the company to Roy for $2,000. Those shares today would be valued at around $33 billion. Though not meaning to, Ub's exit did put Disney in jeopardy. He was well liked around the studio and known for his love of teaching others. Because of this, a good amount of the staff followed him to his new venture, iWorks Studio, including composer Carl Stalin. I went to him when they had any of their questions, and losing that key person at the Disney Studio uh, caused Walt to have a lot of worries about what was going to happen in the future. Ub's reputation around the industry drew many other talented and noteworthy animators to join him, including Grim Natwood, creator of Betty Boop, who like Ub was tired of not getting the freedom and recognition he deserved. Their mission was to create a worthy rival to Mickey Mouse, resulting in the birth of Flip the Frog. iWorks Studio became known for its technical prowess, pioneering innovations like color animation and building the first multi-plane camera on a shoestring budget. While iWorks Studio excelled technically, it struggled to capture audiences' hearts with its characters lacking the charm of Disney's creations. Despite numerous redesigns, Flip the Frog couldn't match Mickey's lovable appeal, and as the country entered the Great Depression, audiences didn't care about technical wizardry, instead went upbeat and lovable characters. The studio had to take on contract work throughout the 1930s to stay afloat. In contrast, Disney not only recovered from Ub's departure, but dominated the 1930s. Mickey Mouse became a certified celebrity. Disney shorts swept the Oscars, and Walt himself received a special Oscar for creating Mickey. The birth of Donald Duck, portrayed by comedian Clarence Nash, added to Disney's success. To top it off, Disney created the first ever animated feature film, Snow White, which triumphed at the box office and the award shows. 
Disney could do no wrong, and iWorks seemed to struggle at every turn. As Disney continued churning out feature-length animated movies, of iWorks faced the difficult decision to close down iWorks Studio. Many of his staff, including Grim Natwick and Carl Stalling, migrated to Disney, while others like Chuck Jones found success with Warner Brothers Looney Tunes. With Disney's expanding production, there emerged a pressing need for animation schools to train a workforce capable of meeting the demands of these projects. In response, Ub, after shuttering his own studio, established one such school. Ub called up Ben Sharpstein, who was in charge of training at Disney, and asked if he had any students he could send over to him. Instead, Sharpstein invited Ub out to lunch and told him he should come back to Disney. Sharpstein had asked Walt about the idea of bringing Ub back. And while Walt was dismissive, telling him he could hire whoever he wanted, when Ub did return, Walt frequently would lean on Ub's knowledge regarding technical problems. And while their personal relationship never went back to what it was before, their professional one, and their shared desire to innovate, remained strong until Walt's death. And now that Ub was back under Disney's roof, he would get to focus all of his energy doing his favorite things. Teach, tinker, and solve problems. While technically in the quality assurance department, his job was to be a floater, solving problems where he saw them and reporting only to Walt. He was able to find the right color mix so the pink elephants and Dumbo would pop against the black background. He devised a system for photographing water for the rain and Bambi. He built a specialized Xerox machine for 101 Dalmatians. And he is largely responsible for the blending of live action and animation in Mary Poppins, earning an Oscar for its efforts. The Academy presents the Class 1 Scientific or Technical Award to Petro Vlahos, Wadsworth E. Pole, and Up Iwerks. Thank you very much. Thank you most sincerely. Usually, this is where the story stops. Ub returns to Disney and becomes a legend. Back with the company he helped build from nothing. But I feel like stopping here would be a discredit to some of the work he did after returning to Disney, and how his experience and talent was able to steer the companies through some murky times. Disney as a studio has had times where it's very much the opposite of the national economy. In the 1930s, when the country was going through the Great Depression, Disney was seeing record profits. And in the 1940s, when the rest of the country was booming from wartime industry, Disney almost collapsed. With the foreign markets closed and all excess resource going towards the war effort, Disney was on the verge of bankruptcy and was only able to stay alive by taking a lot of contracts from the government, making instructional videos for various branches of the U.S. Army. These shorts need to be made fast or cheap, and with little time or resources for quality jokes or any kind of story. Luckily, they had just the man for the job. Ub, in a full circle moment, would save Disney Studios during the war, turning the shop temporarily into a version of iWork Studio, with Ub himself directing and working on many shorts, often uncredited. And while Walt may have hated to see his studio become this, he couldn't say anything because it was the only way to survive. After the war, Ub started the special effects division at Disney as he became the head of the special processes and animation division. Here, he would continue to tinker with mechanical processes and make innovations for the silver screen and Walt's current obsession, Disneyland. Ub and his son Don, who had joined his father at the company, would work on effects throughout the park, such as the projection mapping in the Haunted Mansion or the animatronic Abraham Lincoln. In addition, Ub got loaned out to Alfred Hitchcock on his masterpiece The Birds to create the swelling masses of flying animals that would become iconic. For his effort, Ub got another Oscar nomination. Ub's story would have been lost to time if it weren't for the love of his two sons and his granddaughter, Leslie Iwerks, who wrote the book in a companion with the documentary she made. Ub never bragged or highlighted his own innovations or achievements, and his contributions very well could have been lost to time. Disney Company was initially skeptical of giving Leslie Iwerks access to making a documentary, worried of what she might say, but at the request of then-CEO Roy E. Disney, she was given access to Disney archive footage. And while Disney published her documentary, they do nothing to keep it alive today. 
It is nowhere on their streaming service, and the only physical release of the product is in a bonus feature on disc 2 of the Oswald the Lucky Rabbit compilation. Disney, even now, will acknowledge Ub in a very respectful manner, but also try to move along quickly from him, as his hand in creating Mickey could minimize the brand that is Walt. Even in their newest short, Once Upon a Studio, a very fun watch that celebrates the 100 year history of Disney animation, Ub will make an appearance, seen as a picture on the wall, but he will never get the moment Mickey and Walt get. Disney does continue to work with Leslie Iwerks as she creates the multi-part documentary series The Imagineering Story, where her dad, Don Iwerks, is frequently interviewed about the building of the Disney parks and his work with Ub. If you search Iwerks on Disney+, Plus, more of her work comes up than Ub's. His only direct reference is a short still used in the opening of every Disney animation, Steamboat Willie, directed and drawn by Ub Iwerks. As you can see by its decrepit state, the Laugh Gram studio was left to rot for years before being bought up by a non-profit in order to try and save it from the wrecking ball, a fate that unfortunately befell many historic buildings in Kansas City. The group is called Thank You Walt Disney, and they've had the goal of trying to turn this building into a museum honoring the legacy of the animators who worked here. And while this museum would probably give no credence to the fact of Ub being the creator or even co-creator of Mickey, It'd be nice to see in any way a historical part of Kansas City saved and turned into something worth visiting and the legacy and celebration of Ub Iwerks in any way happen. Purple, purple cinema, purple.